35 million opens at $42. Uber price 45, 32 million shares opened at $42. And you can see. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Paul Bragill. What I'm really well known for, probably here in Silicon Valley, is that I was an early investor and advisory board member to Uber. I joined a company when there was less than 10 people working there. Uh, the valuation was puny. So it was an amazing you know, exit and seeing that company rise is you know, one of the highlights of my career. I made good money being an entrepreneur. I probably could retire off that money, but I've made a lot more as an investor. So I would say, honestly, I was a decent entrepreneur. I'd say pretty good. But I know better entrepreneurs than me, for sure, right? Uh, but I think as a VC, I'm probably a better VC than I am entrepreneur. I feel my skill set's better as a VC than I was an entrepreneur. And I thought I was a pretty good entrepreneur. So uh, yeah, it's I would have never expected that when I was younger. What my portfolio looks like, it's very, very diverse, right? Uh, we have offices on every single continent. And yeah, we've invested in, I think, over 40 different countries around the world. Each region, we tend to invest in slightly different things, right? So like if we're investing in Africa, we're doing most of our education tech or energy, right? If we're here in Silicon Valley, it's a lot more kind of cutting edge, kind of really far out there stuff. If we're doing stuff in Asia, it's more related to whatever's popular in hot net regions. So the portfolio is super diverse. The common theme is amazing founders and a core kind of good founding team. And then yeah, if we like that, then we put more money in. I currently have seven funds that I'm the chairman and founder of. And yeah, it's, like I said, it spans the whole globe. We have one based here in the United States. Uh, we have one in Asia, we have two in Africa, two in Europe, and then one in Latin America. So people always ask me, why do I have funds all around the world? And it's two reasons. I mean, one, I like to travel, so let's be honest, right? This is building to my lifestyle. So I mean, it's a small piece of it, but it, it was something I enjoyed, right? I knew I'd be gone for a year. I was living in San Francisco, so I sold my home, and I was like, okay, full focus, because I want to focus. I didn't want to have like a, you know, well, there's a famous saying, like burn the bridges. Then now that I have all these offices around the world, I'm very rarely in one place for more than a month or two. So it makes almost no sense to have a house. So this last month uh, was the 10th year anniversary of me being nomadic. So I've been doing this for 10 years now. Then two, this was not planned. Again, like I don't plan that far ahead, like, but it was opportunistic, right? So when we launched our first fund here in San Francisco, a lot of governments started coming to us, right? And we had the Singapore government come to us, and we had the Brazil government come to us, and we had Estonian government come to us. And they're like, hey Paul, we'd like to tap into your Silicon Valley network. And like my eyes opened up. I'm like, oh wow, the whole world wants a piece of what's happening innovation-wise and startup-wise here in San Francisco, like maybe I should be the person that helps bridge those countries, right? And so then I kind of took it upon myself to go out there and start funds. And, and as I started traveling to these places and getting to meet the entrepreneurs, I learned two things. One, all the entrepreneurs all around the world from like random parts of Africa to Asia to whatever, they all read similar blogs and they all kind of have the similar information. So people kind of know what's going on, but what they're really missing is one, they're missing access to money. So a lot of these places we went to, we were either the first or one of the first few VC funds in that whole region. And then two, they're missing access to mentors and people who've built companies before. So for instance, like when we went to Southeast Asia and we started our fund in Singapore in 2011, we were one of the first three or four VC funds in the whole region. Not only Singapore, I mean like all Southeast Asia, right? And like. All the entrepreneurs we were meeting, they were the first generation of technology entrepreneurs in that country. So here in Silicon Valley, I was like maybe fourth or fifth generation, right? Those you know, guys who made the transistors and the guys who made chips and then it was like, you know, operating systems and the web stuff and like we were there, right? So I had, I had people before me I could like look up to. In Southeast Asia or Africa or Latin America, there was nobody. They were the first generation. So we want to plug that gap. So I saw an opportunity. Hey, hey, there's smart people here but they need money and they need connections. I could do this, I did it. And so we just started building funds to help support these entrepreneurs around the world. And uh, I get a lot of satisfaction in that, you know, we were one of the first funds in almost every continent around the world. It's really a, a fun legacy to be part of. Yeah, we started the oldest or second oldest VC fund in Africa. And yeah, with that comes a lot of experience, right? A lot of failures. What's interesting about Africa is that the problems you're trying to solve, right? So we're not trying to do like the newest VR headset or artificial intelligence. You're trying to go out there and solve problems there that maybe got solved in Europe and Asia and America 50 years ago, right? So for instance, like one company we got involved in, it's like a brand new shipping and logistics company. So imagine what it would be like to start a brand new like UPS or FedEx. What would you do, right? Like if you had all the technology available to you today, but you could do it in a brand new place and also with all the constraints of the continent, right? So 
We invest in a company called Sendi right now, and it's one of the biggest logistics companies on the continent. It's the biggest one in East Africa. And you look at problems from new technology, but old and weird, you know, local problems, right? It's super cool. Uh, for instance, also, we're involved in a company called Moringa School. It is the largest technology and computer science education school in all of East Africa. How do you go out there and teach young African kids how to program and get them jobs and stuff like that? It's super exciting, but like different problems and like sometimes the power's not working or sometimes connectivity, but like you have to go out there and find ways and solutions to go around it, right? So you're solving problems just in a very different way. And yeah, we've had some really nice companies and they're growing and the turnaround for exits is a longer time scale, but it's super duper rewarding. And yeah, we, you know, we're really proud of our work there in the continent of Africa. When we're looking for a company to invest into, we're trying to get to know the founders, right? And yeah, sometimes you meet a founder and they just kind of cold email you or they kind of come, but like that's really hard because you have to build a relationship quickly before you make the deal. So ideally, we prefer to, one, we're looking at their background. So we're asking a lot like, what did you do before? When you were younger, what were you like? When you were at university, were you building stuff? Were you reverse joining a lot of clubs? Like, we're trying to get an idea of what the person was up until today. And then once we have that, then we're asking like, and so if we give you money today, what are you gonna do here? And what are you gonna do here? We're gonna do there. And so we're just kind of testing the person to see how they think, to see how they process things, to see have they shown qualities of being an entrepreneur before? Have they been persevering? Have they not given up easily? We're just looking for little hints. There's no one answer that's like, oh, if he says that or she said that. No, it's more like you get an idea of what the person's made of. Are they doing this for only the money? Are they doing this because it's exciting? Are they doing it because they're curious, right? So you have to kind of find out what their inner motivation is. You as a founder don't give up, right? You go out there, yeah, you're flexible, you kind of change your path, you go out there, you persevere. If you could see that quality of a person either historically or even in the kind of first steps they've taken as a company, that's a huge sign to me. And I get excited when I meet somebody who I could see is like, okay, this person's up for the fight. I mean, yeah, so like risk is actually part of the venture capital business. People invest with us to take risks, right? So people trust me as a good risk taker. I've had a history of taking good risks. But yeah, I mean, also the point is venture capital, it's a portfolio game, right? So I don't invest in one company. You know, per fund, we invest in 30 or 40 companies, right? So we're diversifying the risk across multiple companies, right? So each company individually, super duper risky. But as a portfolio, it's not as risky as it is, right? And so consistently, we've never had a fund that lost money, you know? knock on wood. Uh, but yeah, the key thing is you diversify your risk by investing in many companies. If I invested one, three, or five, there's a very high chance I would lose all my money. But when you invest in tons, you know, one company pays off for the whole fund, a couple pay off, you know, give you extra returns, and then many fail. That's just a reality, right? And so we kind of have it built into our mindset to take a lot of risk. Within the first couple of years, we were pretty well known for what we were doing, right? Uh, but that was more on hype than actually results because venture capital is a long-term game, right? So you don't know how well you're doing. You might be well known, but you might not have made any money, right? So in the first couple of years, we made some cool deals, but the money wasn't yet. But now, you know, many years later, we've had really good returns and we've built many funds. So I'd say probably really well known, maybe in the last, or really well, respected, I would say, has happened in the last five or so years. People know our track record, people know that we're on multiple funds, people know that we've raised funds all around the world, so that kind of took time. I guess the key thing is, like, one, focus on humans, right? So just always be curious about people, right? Uh, I'd say be curious in general, right? So what's cool about VC is, like, you're paid to learn new stuff, right? Or you're paid to, like, invest alongside people who are gonna create new industries or disrupt industries, right? So stay curious, stay humble, and what I say by humble is like, don't put yourself above people, just be nice to people, you know, listen to people, and I think everything else kind of comes afterwards. But as long as you're, you're kind of very curious and you're nice to people, and I'd say also hardworking, if you have two of those three, if not all three skill sets, you'll do pretty well. But yeah, you have to listen, you have to understand, you have to like absorb information and process it, and, you know, kind of make decisions based upon that. People always ask me, why do I do these things? I like to set goals. I love stories and I love adventure. You know, I read a lot of books when I was younger about like people going to the end of the world or, you know, explorers. I love people who explore stuff. I love people who do new things. And so, yeah, like I've always fashioned myself kind of an explorer. I'm saying it more like a modern day way or exploring my body, exploring my limits. I like to go out there and do things like that. And so whenever I come up with an idea and it kind of clicks, I, I start doing it. And so the whole point for me is like, I am living life chasing after the next beautiful story. So yeah, like when I biked across America, for instance, I had not ridden a bike for maybe 15 years. I was out there drinking with some of my friends, 
And one guy's like, yeah, I heard about this guy who biked across America. And I'm like, that's a really cool idea. I came home after a few drinks. I called my brother, Dan. I'm like, dude, we're gonna bike across America. What do you think? He's like, uh, right? Then we talked next morning and we made a plan. And then two weeks later, I bought a bicycle because I didn't own a bike. And we started biking. The idea inspired me. The idea seemed crazy, but also still somewhat attainable. And I just do it. Also, like, I don't overthink it. Because if I sat down there, I made all the plans and all the maps. No, I would have never done it because I would have convinced myself this is stupid, right? But when I just say yes and I move forward, that's when great things happen, right? So I have to get inspired. And then once I commit to something, I just do it. If you overthink things, you will usually talk yourself out, right? But once you take that first step, then the second and third step are much easier, right? Just starting. So it's really simple, but it, it's the hardest thing to do a lot of times. Everyone has an idea, right? Not, that doesn't make it special. What makes it special is execution, the way you're building the company. Nobody wants your idea. You have to start building yourself, right? No one's gonna build the idea for you. You have to take ownership of your own ideas and own them and build them. The best way to get to me quickly and to get the best attention is to talk to some portfolio company of mine and get introduction. That's the best way. You know, being that we've been around for a while, we have a lot of companies, also a lot of friends, so people make sure that you know they kind of look out for us. Like, so I have certain friends, they, they know not to send me crap. If they send me crap, then I start I stop responding to their emails. It's like a give and take relationship. So people that know the reputation, like, and people get to know what, what our style is, and so people know what to send us usually. You know, being that we have some of the most famous funds around the world, like people know what kind of quality we're expecting. Then number two is finding a way to contact one of my team members, and then they get to me. And then third, I do accept cold emails. My email is paul at goldengate.vc. I have also many other emails, but that's one you know, I check very often. And I do read the emails. It doesn't mean I respond, I usually do not. But sometimes, somebody catches my eye, right? So, but the first two options are better. Get an introduction through one of my portfolio companies, come through one of my team members. If not, then cold email or cold LinkedIn, whatever.